What's up everybody? It is currently 8.20 a.m. and it's 37 degrees out. So I'm kind of like freezing right now. Let me fix this camera a little bit. It's like not where I want it. Okay, yeah, it's 8.20 a.m. and I am like totally freezing right now. It's, it's super cold out. But um, I actually, so if you can see, I'm out in the woods right now, kind of like out back here, right? Some pretty awesome woods. I love going back here. Um, it's really fun. And so I usually film by like just bringing my computer out on the log and then putting it out so that I can um, rest my phone on it so I could kind of put it on a stand. And I actually, the video I made of Isaiah chapter 47, I left the computer outside so now it's all like soaking wet um i haven't tried to turn it on yet because i'm kind of scared because i think it's probably broken so um pray for my computer that is not good <laughs> but um i'm gonna put up the stand and then we're going to dive into isaiah chapter uh 48 today all right so we're gonna read isaiah 28 8 and 9 um just like every time that kind of rhyme um, but it says this Isaiah 28 8 and 9 to whom will he teach knowledge and to whom will he explain the message those who are weaned from the milk those taken from the breast for it is precept upon precept precept upon precept line upon line and line upon line oh wait did I miss here a little and there a little. And so Isaiah is telling us from this verse specifically that if we want to gain knowledge and understanding of God, it comes from precept upon precept or line upon line. And I want to encourage you in your own devotional life to systematically read through the Bible. I think it's the, one of the most transforming um, practices and, and habits that you can put in your entire life. Um, Isaiah chapter 55 says that the word of God never returns void, meaning every single time that it goes out, it's going to accomplish um, and a purpose, even if you don't feel like it is right away. Uh, my Bible teacher yesterday said that we're to have a steady diet. And I really like that word. It's like almost like the same way you would have a steady diet when you make sure not to miss a meal. Um, for eating the same way we should have a steady diet to not make miss a spiritual meal of God's Word so I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna get into Isaiah chapter 48 this is kind of strange is a little annoying isn't it I'll fix that for you all right father I just thank you for today Lord I thank you that um, even in the cold Lord um, you're still with me God I pray that you would uh, keep me keep me warm by your love <laughs> i pray that you would open up your word open up our eyes to see god your glory because that's all we ask for just to see a little bit more of your glory teach us to take heed according to your word god because if we don't take heed according to it if we don't practice it and apply it and obey it uh it's worthless james says that the one who does not do the word is like a man who looks in the mirror and forgets what he looks like so father i pray that we would and i would personally continue to take heed according to your word and just to walk with you every day thank you for your love jesus in your name amen so today i actually kind of had I'll just share a little bit like a struggle waking up out of bed so i was having some crazy dreams last night I don't know about you guys, you ever just have like, maybe it's something you ate. Oh, you know what it is? I had a chocolate Pop-Tart. Uh, my roommate gave me a chocolate Pop-Tart last night and I just totally ate it at like 12 o'clock at night and it probably messed with my like mind a little bit, all that sugar and stuff. So I just had some crazy dreams and I tried to wake up at like seven. I was gonna go to the gym. I was gonna kind of start my day early. Because I like, I like waking up early. It's just something that I love to do and kind of getting a head start on the day. I think it's a great thing to, to 
to get a good morning going. But I just totally like had a struggle getting out of bed and I don't know. Sometimes my dad actually calls it blanket victory. Like sometimes you just lose the battle of waking up and sometimes I feel like not 100% myself when I'm not kind of waking up the time I want to. Um, and just sleep, sleeping in can make me like feel guilty in such a weird way. Um, and it's such a false way. And sometimes, I don't know, sometimes it's hard to, to just get out of bed and just start the day. Sometimes you just need that extra kick in the butt. And this morning I kind of slept in past, past the time. So I just wanted to, to share that with you and just say that I, I sometimes struggle just to, to get up, you know. But, you know, I start my day in the Word and I'm comforted by it and I'm reminded of truth. And I just wanted to share that and say, like, I'm, I'm just a guy in the midst of my own journey with Jesus, with my own struggles, my own sins. And um, I'm just thankful that God is, is teaching me so much, though, and he wants to use me. And I know that. Um, this morning I actually blew dry my blue blue dry or blow dried. I don't know how you would say it. I blow dried my hair. Uh, and it was actually kind of satisfying. I I never really do that. I just usually just kind of like wash it down, but it was pretty cool. So Isaiah chapter 48. I'm like totally rambling right now. It says this, verse 1. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel. Oh wait, before I start I want to give you an outline of Isaiah chapter 48. I, I got a little excited. I'm just really excited right now. I love God. Okay. Um, so the book of Isaiah was written by the person Isaiah who was a prophet. A prophet's job was to take what God showed them and declare it to the people. So the messages in the book of Isaiah are what Isaiah got from God and transferred over to the nation of Israel specifically. But although they're for the nation of Israel specifically, a lot of the truths apply to the believer of Jesus personally. Isaiah was called the mini Bible because it had 66 chapters included in it, just like the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation has 66 books. So they would call Isaiah the mini Bible. So we're in Isaiah chapter 40. Um, if you're in Isaiah chapter 48, Verses 1 through 12, 1 through 11, sorry, talk about the um, refining process of God, him refining his people. Verses 12 through 17 is the Lord's call to come home, to come back. And then verses 18 through 22 are the blessings of obedience. So we're going to start in verse 1. It says this, Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and who came down from the waters of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and confess the God of Israel, but not in truth or right. For they call themselves after the holy city and stay themselves on the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts is his name. In verse 1, it says that Israel is called by God's name. They're not just kind of known about or heard of, but they're literally called by name. Isaiah, just a, a few chapters back in 45, says this to Israel. Isaiah 45, verse 4, For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. You see, God knows our names, each one of our names, but he actually knows way more than just our names. In Luke 12, Luke chapter 12, um, Jesus says this, talking about how much he knows us. And this is Jesus' words. He says in Luke 12, verse 6, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. 
Fear not, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Okay, Jesus says that even the hairs of your head are numbered. So like even the hairs that I just blow dried, which there's probably a lot, right? Look at these. There's probably a lot of hair, but God has it all numbered. And it's kind of God trying to show us through this language that he knows you so well. He knows so much about you and he loves you and he cares about you. And it says this, who swear by my name of the Lord and confess the God of Israel. Romans 10, speaking of being saved from God's wrath and being saved, says in Romans 10:10, 10, 10, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes and is considered righteous but with the mouth one confesses and is being saved so the people of Israel at the time they were confessing to be believers in God they were confessing to be God's children but their actions did not line up with their words at all um, there's a saying that I love to share and it's this your walk your walk talks and your talk talks but does your walk talk louder than your talk talks you see, your actions speak louder than your words. In Israel, they were talking up a storm about who they were. But God says, but not in truth or right. You say, they were, they were saying they were Christians. They were saying they loved God. But their actions were so contrary to this word that it was like just a flat out lie. You see, Isaiah 29 verse 13 says this. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Uh, let me find it. Isaiah 29. It says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by man. And this is exactly what the nation of Israel is doing. And this is exactly what we can do as Christians, as believers in God. We can, we can love God and claim to follow him, but then walk a completely different way. And God's saying, look, I don't want your mouth service. I don't want your lip service. I want your obedience. I want you to do what I say. It says this in verse three, the former things I declared of old they went out from my mouth and I announced them I suddenly and then suddenly I did them and they came to pass because I know that you are obstinate and your neck is as an iron sinew and your forehead brass figurative language saying that God can't you're so stiff-necked in your ways verse 5 I declared them to you from old before they came to pass, I announced them to you. You see, God loves to tell us the future through the Bible. One third of the Bible is prophetic literature, meaning that it's speaking of things that happened in the past that are going to happen in the future. And God's saying, look, you have no excuse. I'm saying all of these things and these prophecies are being fulfilled before your eyes. Isaiah chapter 53 we're gonna get there soon, but it's an amazing chapter talking about Jesus. I'll just read a little bit. Verse three says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Verse four says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Verse five says, but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Verse six says, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, God makes it clear that the, the Messiah is going to come and be pierced and crushed. And then we look at Jesus in the New Testament and the history shows us that a man named Jesus, he was pierced on the cross and crushed and literally crushed and beaten to a point where he didn't even look like a human 
but it was so that he could take our iniquities. So Isaiah is saying, look, I'm trying to show you the things that are to come. Lest you say, verse 5, my idol did them, and my carved image and my mental image commanded them. Um, God saying that you can't say that someone else did it because I'm the one who made these things happen in your life. I'm the one who gave you this grace. I'm the one who allowed you to have this job. I'm the one who allows you to have your breath. It wasn't you. So you can't say that it was someone else. Um, in math class this year, we had to make a, um, do an art project kind of craft. And I had a friend help me. And we sat down at this table and we're working on this math project. And if you know anything about me, I'm really horrible at arts and crafts and drawing. Like I try to draw stuff, but it just turns out to look like a fifth grader. Like I can do stick figures okay, but, and then sometimes I used to draw the people like a little bit more than stick figures, like with the pants and then like the outline 3D shirt. But like, I'm just horrible at draw, drawing and like gluing and cutting. I've just never liked it really. I mean, some people are really gifted with crafts. I'm just not. But my friend like really helped me and she basically did the whole project and like I kind of sat there and was like kind of like hoping that she would keep on helping me and she ended up finishing it and I was super thankful but it's kind of this idea that you can't say that you did it if someone else did the job for you you see you can't say that an idol or something that you worship is the one giving you your success when it's really God who's giving you your success I don't know if that analogy made any sense, but <laughs> I tried. It says, verse 6, You have heard, now see all this, and you will not declare it. From this time forth I announce to you new things, hidden things that you have not known. Jeremiah 33, verse 3 says, Call upon me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not, that, that you don't know. You see, we can know more about God by asking him to show us more. Show us more of your love, Father. Lord, teach me to know you more intimately today. Uh, Jesus said, I am gentle and lowly. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You see, Jesus wants to constantly be teaching us every day. We have to be, uh, one of my mentors says, class is always in session. You see, we can't shut our minds off to God because he wants to show us new things. They are created now, not long ago. Before today, you have never heard of them. Lest you should say, behold, I never knew them. You have never heard, you have never known. From old, your ear, ha your ear has not been opened. For I knew that I would surely deal treacherously. And from that time before birth, you were called a rebel. You see, they were hearing the truth, they were seeing the truth, but they really weren't understanding it. And we can't really understand spiritual things unless God helps us. You see, we can't actually understand the Bible unless your eyes are open to see it, unless you're born again. Jesus says you must be born again. You see... To understand the things of God, you have to be a child of God. And to be a child of God, you have to be born again by the Spirit. You have to look at Jesus on the cross and fully surrender your life to Him. And say, Jesus, I'm yours. And then when you do that, God will put His Spirit in you and allow you to understand the Bible. It's, it's the same way that if... Um, someone who has perfect pitch can hear a sound and know oh that's a c major oh that's an f sharp that's a a flat right but if you don't know about music you're going to hear these things and it's just going to sound foreign to you it's the same way if we try to understand the bible without being saved we're not going to understand it it's going to be foreign to us 
It says, For my name's sake I defer my anger, and for the praise of I, I restrain it for you, that I may not be cut off. Sometimes the hardest thing ever is to not be angry, to not lash out. I remember when I was younger, me and my cousin used to always do like WWE wrestling fights. We would like hang out and I would be this guy named Rey Mysterio and he would be, his favorite guy was um, Triple H. And um, we would just fight and mess around and wrestle. And I remember one time, um, his name's John, is my cousin. John just like put me in a chokehold or something and I like couldn't breathe for a second. And then something happened, like, I just snapped. Like, I totally snapped on this kid. And I was like, oh yeah! And I just went ape, and then we started, like, actually fighting. It was kind of like the first fight I've ever been in, if you count that as a fight, if it's family. And so we just started, like, lashing out at each other. We were on this, like, we were fighting on top of a bed. So we were just, like, slamming each other on the bed, and I was, like, stomping on him. But, like, we were hitting each other. Like, no one got really hurt, but, like, I got really angry. I just got like, like I, it's hard to get me like really angry, but that was like my first memory of just getting ticked off. But it says this, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. You know, sometimes the hardest thing to do, especially in a heated moment, sometimes with family, when someone explodes or when someone gets loud or, or maybe with a friend who has a disagreement and you're passionate about it and you want to, you want to just lash out. God's saying, look, I'm going to defer my anger on you. I'm not going to punish you. In the same way, we are to be just like the Lord in his love and how we treat others. We're not supposed to lash out on them, but we're supposed to keep our anger from controlling us. Verse 10, coming, we're almost at the end of the refining process. It says this, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it, for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. You see, God wants to refine us into looking more like Jesus. It's called sanctification. It's the process of being more and more like Jesus. First Peter chapter one says that the tested genuineness of your faith, or he says, um. You have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, and then he says this, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may result in glory and honor and praise at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, God tests us because in testing us, we're more refined. Oftentimes, the circumstances in our life that come are really God trying to refine us to be more stronger. You see, if you're in the gym and you're lifting weights and something's too heavy, that overload on your tension, on your chest, on your muscles is going to be the very thing where growth starts to take place, where, where newness starts to take place, where new muscle fibers and protein can fix it. And he's using the analogy of gold. When you put gold in the fire, um, it melts off in the furnace the impurities. But that gold, to be pure gold, has to be put through the furnace. And in the same way, we have to really be put through the furnace in life sometimes so that our impurities, our flesh, ourselves, can be more like Jesus. All right, so now we come from 12 to 17, and I'm going to go a little bit faster here. Um, this is the section where God is calling us to come home. It says this, Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, whom I called. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. You see, in Revelation chapter 1, in the very last book of the Bible, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. It shows that Jesus is fully God and fully, fully God because Jesus says, I'm the first and the last. And God the Father says, I'm the first and the last. Therefore, Jesus is God. Verse 13 says this, because there can't be two firsts and lasts. 
It says this, my hand laid the foundation of the earth, my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. Assemble, all of you, and listen. Who among you has declared these things? The Lord loves him, for he shall perform his purpose on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. God's showing us, look, I'm against these other nations, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians. God's saying, I'm for you, I'm not against you. The Lord loves him. Oh, I already read that. <laughs> Even I have spoken and called him. I have brought him, and he will prosper in his way. Verse 16 says this, Draw near to me and hear this. From the beginning I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Verse 16 says, Draw near to me and hear this. My favorite verse, perhaps my favorite verse in the entire Bible. This verse has changed my life and it's got me through a lot of hard times. It's James 4 verse 8. And it says this. It's so, so simple. It's just that simple. It says this. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. But it says this in the beginning, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's how a relationship works. If you take a step close to God, he promises to take a step close to you. You see, so many people say, I feel so far from God. I just feel like he's not there. And my next question would be, are you drawing near to God? Because his word promises that if you draw near, he will take the effort to draw near to you. And so God is saying in Isaiah, draw near to me. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit and leads you in the way you should go. You see, God wants to lead and guide us in the way that we are to go. Verse 18 through 22 talks about um, the motivations for us to obey. So we know the gospel says that you're forgiven of everything of your sins, past, present, and future, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and in your place, and he rose again to show that everything he said was true. That's the gospel. So the gospel says, even if you lack in your obedience to me, I still forgive you because of your faith. Even if you're not fully following me, I still forgive you because you're my child and I love you like a son. So it's not about obedience that God is most concerned about, but it's our faith in him. But our faith in him, if it is real, authentic faith, leads to obedience. Because God accepts us, and out of the love that he accepts us, we, in result, now can actually obey God and keep what he says. And so Jesus is saying to Israel, who remember in the beginning, Israel said, that they confessed to be of the Lord, but their actions were really far off. And so God is crying out here to us today. It says this. I would encourage you to circle verses 18 and 19. It says this. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Um, sometimes in school, I find myself dozing off, right? I mean, in high school, when your teacher's just rambling, especially after you had like no sleep. And in college, I find myself uh, getting tired a lot in class. I have a hard time paying attention sometimes. <laughs> I've, um, I gotta like wake myself up. But it says this, Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like the sand and your descendants like its grains. Their name would never be cut off or destroyed from me or before me. 
Go out from Babylon, free from Chaldea. Declare this with a shout of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Though they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts, he made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and the water gushed out. Verse 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. You see, it's simple. We can be forgiven by Jesus, but sin still has effect on us. You see, though we're dead to sin, like Romans 6 says, that sin has no longer dominion of under us because we're not under the law anymore, but under grace. St sin still affects us in this life. You see, it's so simple. Sin leads to sadness and holiness leads to happiness. You see, you can be forgiven and loved by God, but if you're living in sin, you're going to be stressed out and sad and depressed and overwhelmed and constantly burdened. And it's going to still take a toll on you unless you cut it out of your life. You see, and holiness leads to happiness. It says, if you paid attention to my commandments, you would have peace like a river and you would have righteousness like the waves of the sea. You see, there's certain sins that we fall into, but there's also sins that we continually plan for and just keep on going in this path and it's killing us on the inside and we know it and it's been so long and it's just killing us. It's taking us apart, and I know that so well because I've been soaked in sin in parts of my life, just constantly going back. And God's saying so clearly that you'll have peace. You'll have true peace if you cut this out. You'll have your righteousness if you just spend time with the Lord Sometimes we don't need to be delivered from a spirit of sin or, or have these crazy things happen. We just need to stop doing it. Just there's some things where God's simply telling you, hey, just cut it out. Just simple as that, cut it out, right? And there is a real peace when you have a clear conscience. Paul writes in the New Testament, I make sure that I have a clear conscience before anyone, before I ever come to speak and to go before people. You see, if there's a sin in our lives, 1 John says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sin, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's so simple. It's, you just pray, Father, I just thank you for forgiving you for, for your everlasting forgiveness. I know what I was, did was wrong. I just confess that to you now. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you for the cross. I love you, Lord. Amen. Man, that sin burden that you had is lifted away by Jesus when you apply the blood of Jesus to your sin. Verse 22 says, There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. I used to listen to this song a lot called um, There Ain't No Rest for the Wicked by Cage the Elephant. It was one of my favorite jams. But it would go like this. There ain't no rest for the wicked. I don't want to sing, actually. I'm trash at singing. There ain't no rest for the wicked. Money don't grow on trees. I got bills to pay. I got mouths to feed. There ain't nothing in this world for free. I can't back down. I won't hold back, even though I know it's true. There ain't no rest for the wicked till we close our eyes for good. And that's the truth. If we're living in wickedness and in sin, you're just going to live a restless life. So we're just going to close in prayer. Father, I just thank you for your love today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus who forgives us from all our sins, past, present, and future, who will cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we just come to you and confess our wrongdoings to you. Pray that you would um, seal the word on our hearts, bring conviction, bring regeneration by your spirit, bring salvation. Praise in your name, Jesus. Amen.